This video provides a brief tour on the history of radioactivity. By no means is the video comprehensive. There have literally been thousands of experiments that have made co important contributions to this field. However, in this video, we'll focus on some of the key original discoveries leading to our current understanding of nuclear chemistry. So you may find in your lifetime that future scientific discoveries within this field may change the way that we actually think about nuclear science. It's truly a fascinating field where discoveries happen on a daily basis. Our tour begins in the late 1800s with a German physicist named Wilhelm Rankin. Around this time, many physicists in Europe were fascinated with cathode rays. The term cathode ray might be familiar to you because around this time, another physicist named J.J. Thompson found the cathode rays were comprised of tiny little negatively charged particles, things that we now call electrons. It was this discovery that led Thompson to propose the plum pudding model. Rankin, on the other hand, was interested in the electric discharge that was passed through a vacuum tube. When he energized a variation of a cathode ray tube, something that we call a Leonard vacuum tube, a barium platino cyanide screen in his lab actually began to fluoresce or glow. Rankin deduced that this glowing was the result of some mysterious ray that was emitted through the aluminum screen. Over the next several weeks, Rankin refined his experiments and eventually named these mysterious emissions X-rays. Recall from our study of quantum mechanics that X-rays are a type of high-energy ionizing electromagnetic radiation. X-rays serve a variety of purposes, and most notably, they allow for radiography in the medical industry. While on the subject of radiographs, it's worth noting that several weeks after discovering X-rays, Rankin convinced his wife to let him shine these x-rays over her hand as it laid on photographic paper. X-rays easily pass through the soft tissue and expose the photographic plate. X-rays fail to penetrate more dense materials like bone and metal, so these areas remain unexposed on the photographic paper. So what you're actually looking at in this picture is the first radiograph in human history. It's a little blurry because the technique at the time hadn't quite yet been refined, but you can clearly see the finger bones, and you'll also notice this a uh, circular disc that's right about there. And this is actually a ring that she was wearing on her left hand. Our understanding of radiography is much better today than it was in the late 1800s. But it's interesting to note that this all began with a simple x-ray image of Anna Bertha Rankin's left hand. Our tour continues with a man named Henri Becquerel, who, like his father, had a fascination with phosphorescent materials, those that glow under certain conditions. He was curious to know if phosphorescent materials could, like Rankin's x-rays, develop photographic paper. With some experimentation, Becquerel eventually discovered that uranium, when placed on a wrapped photographic plate and then placed in the sun, exposed the photographic paper in the shape of the ore. Sunlight was needed to make the uranium ore phosphoresce, similar to how glow-in-the-dark stickers need to be charged in order to work. The plate was wrapped in paper to ensure that the phosphorescing uranium was causing the exposure and not the sunlight. A variation of this experiment involved sandwiching a metal Maltese cross between the uranium ore and wrapped photographic paper. In this image that you're seeing right here, you can see the outline of the Maltese cross within the uranium ore's silhouette. This outcome indicated that these mysterious rays had difficulty penetrating through high-density objects like metals. I provided a cartoon to try to illustrate this experiment in a little more detail. Here we can see that the sunlight is acting on the uranium ore. You'll notice that the Maltese cross is sandwiched between the uranium ore and the wrapped photographic plate. Becquerel was likely motivated by his discoveries and planned to conduct additional experiments with phosphorescent uranium. An interesting twist occurred on a particularly overcast day in Paris. On this day, Becquerel was unable to activate his uranium sample, so he scrapped his experiment. He placed the uranium ore on a photographic plate in a drawer for safekeeping. When he developed the plate days later, Becquerel observed the exact same effect. The uranium ore exposed the wrapped photographic plate. Becquerel rushed to read his findings before the French Academy of Sciences literally a day after he made his initial discovery. His report was eventually published in a scientific journal called Compte Renew. Here's a brief excerpt from his article that is certainly worth sharing. I will insist particularly upon the following fact, which seems to me quite important and beyond the phenomenon which one could expect to observe. The same crystalline crust, arranged in the same way with respect to the photographic plates, in the same conditions and through the same screens, but sheltered from the excitation of incident rays and kept in darkness, still produces the same photographic images. 
Becquerel's discovery spawned an interest in uranic rays amongst the physics community. In fact, one Ernest Rutherford, the same physicist associated with the gold foil experiment, is credited with separating these uranic rays. Rutherford found that when uranic rays were passed through a magnetic field, deflections occurred. One deflected stream bent towards the positive pole, while the other deflected stream bent towards the negative pole. These results collectively indicated that the uranic ray stream comprised positive and negative particles, species that would eventually be referred to as alpha and beta particles. A third stream passed through the magnetic field without any deflection. Rutherford called this stream gamma rays, which we now know are quite similar to X-rays, but much higher in energy. One key distinction is that gamma rays derive from an atom's nucleus, whereas X-rays generally originate from outside the atom's nucleus, often from electronic transitions. One of the key details that chemistry students should know is the properties of each of these types of radiation. If you take a radioactive material and you place it in a lead box, Rutherford's findings teach us that three types of radiation will be emitted. The first is alpha particles. These are heavy, positively charged particles. More specifically, they're helium nuclei composed of two protons and two neutrons with a total mass of four AMU. Because of their high charge, alpha particles have very high ionizing abilities, but the relatively massive size prevents them from penetrating too deeply. In this diagram, a very thin piece of lead will deflect the alpha particles. But another way to think about it is that the dead skin cells on your body are actually enough to deflect them as well. Beta particles are just electrons, which makes them very lightweight and negatively charged. Relative to alpha particles, they have a slightly less ionizing ability, but their smaller size means that they have better penetrating ability. Often, thicker clothing, such as a laboratory jacket, is enough to deflect the stream of beta particles. Gamma rays, just as we discussed, are high energy electromagnetic radiation. Because they are massless, gamma rays have a very high penetrating ability. They can easily pass through most objects. However, because they're not charged, gamma rays have little ionizing ability. One analogy that previous chemistry students have found useful is to think of each of these particles as either being an 18-wheeler truck, a car, or a motorcycle on a busy highway. An alpha particle is a lot like an 18-wheeler truck. It's big, it's bulky, and in traffic, it moves very, very slowly. Beta particles are a lot like a medium-sized car. They can get around traffic pretty well, but they're still subject to traffic jams. Gamma rays are like motorcycles. They're small, they're fast, and they can easily weave in and out of traffic when cars and trucks can't. The final stop on our tour is a hero to many, Madame Curie. She was Polish. She married French physicist Pierre Curie and took his last name. In the late 1800s, while working as a graduate student at the University of Paris, Marie Curie decided to study uranic rays to see if there were other elements that exhibited the same properties. Pierre worked alongside Marie and together they discovered that uranium, element number 88, and polonium, element number 84, also emitted uranic rays. You'll see that these elements here, number 88 and number 84, and even uranium for that matter, are pretty low on the periodic table. So this tells you that they're pretty massive atoms. That is, they have a pretty large nucleus and a ton of electrons. Pierre and Marie Curie's discoveries earned them the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics alongside Henri Becquerel. Now, since this is a chemistry course, it's worth noting that Marie and Pierre went on to continue their research until Pierre's untimely death. After this time, Marie went on to isolate radium, a feat that was recognized in 1911 when she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Despite all of her successes, she was not well regarded within society. And a curious twist in the story occurred when young Albert Einstein, also considered an outcast within society, reached out to tell her to stay on course and keep doing wonderful things. There are copies of this letter widely available on the internet. And I invite you to take two or three minutes to read exactly what Einstein wrote. One thing I'll end our tour on is that if you're ever in Europe and go to visit Paris, go look for a building called the Pantheon that's here. It's a very Greek-influenced church. I took a few students there several years ago, and we spent an hour or two walking through the Pantheon's crypt. Here's an image of what the crypt kind of looks like. This is where several famous French national heroes are interred, and this honor is only allowed by parliamentary approval. Now, the term crypt is often associated with being kind of like a dirty, dingy, and scary place to store bodies, but the Pantheon's crypt is actually quite beautiful inside, and some of the famous people you'll find down there include Victor Hugo, Louis Braille, Alexander Dumas, and Pierre Marie Curie. So this is an image of Marie Curie, um, where she's interred, and then Pierre Curie is interred down here. 
for me, it was a hauntingly formative experience, and I still think about it to this day, that I was in the same room as two of the most famous scientists in the world. It's definitely worth a visit if you ever happen to be in Paris. For those of you who may want to fund an expedition to go explore some of these famous interred scientists, please contact me. All right. So let's do a quick review to see what you've gained from this video. First question, uh, true or false? Uranium ore radioactivity can be charged by exposing it to the sun. Pause the video and think about if the statement is true or false. Okay, so in this instance, the answer is false. This was the question that Henri Becquerel aimed to answer. He ultimately discovered that uranium emitted radioactivity when it was placed on a photographic plate and stored away from ambient light. Let's try the next one. By 1903, which of the following elements was not known to be radioactive? Pause the video and think about which elements were known to be radioactive around the year 1903. For this problem, the answer is copper. Remember, by 1903, it was known that uranium was radioactive. Also around this time, Marie and Pierre Curie had discovered that polonium and radium emitted radiation. So the best answer in this case is copper. That's not to say that copper isn't radioactive. In fact, there are some copper isotopes that are known to be radioactive, but they were not discovered until well after 1903.